Hi, this is a Drumways Mix, and today I'm here with a drummer who's worked with the likes of Matt Berry. He's been a drummer for the Blues Brothers show, and he is the director and lead drum teacher at Music Station in Tunbridge. And for those people watching that don't know, James was my drum tutor at West Kent College back in like the early 2000s, 2001, 2002. Um, and so I've known James for quite a long time, and I just thought it'd be really nice to do one of these interviews with him. This is Drumwise Meets James Sedge. Hi James. Hello Tom, good to see you. So, my first question for you today, James. What age did you get into drums and what bands or artists inspired you when you first started playing? Well, I was probably a bit older than many of my students actually i started to listen to drums at the age of about 14. i became quite obsessed with listening i didn't play I, in fact i didn't have any aspirations to play well i was pretty obsessed with neil peart um, and phil collins so i remember buying the abacab album by genesis and i remember coming home on the bus with moving pictures on vinyl. I'd never heard a note of it, put it on my turntable, Tom Sawyer, blasted out, and I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> it completely blew my mind. So um, over the next couple of years, I got really obsessed, and at the age of 18, finally bought a drum kit. Um, and just very slowly picked it up. And you mentioned your first drum kit, buying your first drum kit there. What was that kit? Oh, well, it was a premier club. Um, it wasn't a great kit. It had concert toms, which I would love to have back again now because they're very hard to get hold of, concert toms. Um, so I used that for about a year. And then, oops, I was really lucky. I saw an amazing drummer in Maidstone in a small jazz club. Um, called the Hazlitt Lounge. It wasn't even the theatre, it was the small lounge. And I had no idea about jazz or anything, but I thought I ought to go. And the drummer was a guy called John Christensen, who is possibly one of the greatest drummers who's ever lived. Um, for the ECM label, worked with Keith Jarrett and those guys. And he had a sonar kit. And I thought, oh, wow, I like this guy. So I bought a Sona Performer um, and I used that until about oh God, the year 2000. I toured with it, I recorded with it. Um, it was an amazing kit. So yeah, the Sona Performer was my first proper kit. Cool. And do you still have either of those kits, the Premier or the Sona? Uh, I sold it to a student. It was sitting there and I just thought, oh, the student really needed the kit so I sold it to him for a really good price and as you do a few years later I thought oh, have you still got that kit he said no I've logged it <laughs> so it's gone but never mind I I do have quite a few drum kits now and that leads me nicely on to my next question then so what equipment do you currently use obviously you know when you're out actually gigging um, and you know you can talk talk to us about your your teaching setup too sure okay well um, as I'm sitting in my home studio um, I use V drums for teaching because they're great you know it all goes into the box there's no spill the student gets to hear really good quality sounds as you're obviously aware of um, so the, the Ronans are good and we have in my music school, music station, we have a room with five TD17 kits. And um, the kids just love it, you know. They all play together, headphones, we feed the stuff through, um, all the backing music. And um, so the Roland kits are fantastic. But um, for my recording side, um, I, I've got a Ludwig 1968 um, vintage. And it's incredible. Um, that bass drum. Um, I did a little bit of research on it, actually, like a saddo, mm -hmm. and found out that the Ludwig kits of the 60s had, um, they used wood that they'd bought 
um, from a warehouse and the wood was already a hundred years old. So the kits from the sixties, you know, they're 150 years old. Mm. And so that's, I think part of the sound from the Tom's floor, Tom just sounds incredible. Um, so I've got the 68 Ludwig. I've got a 68 uh, Acrolyte snare, which I just love. Um, and I, I've got a Sona uh, Century or Centenary snare, uh, 76, which I think it's a bit of a, a Ludwig 400 kind of copy, but that's got a lot of sessions. Um, and I just use random symbols. People that insist on having all the same brand, I don't understand. Um, if anyone's ever gone into a, a good recording studio with house gear, then you'll have a Gretsch bass drum and a Ludwig snare and a Sabian hi-hat. And it's, it's whatever sounds good. So um, I've got many, many cymbals, but I do like the Istanbul range. Um, but I use K's and you know, all the good, all the brands are good, aren't they? You know, if anyone says they're not, then they're, they must be crazy. You know, any of the major brands, when you buy the top end, they sound beautiful. Mm. So it's just a taste thing, really. Yeah, certainly. And just because you mentioned Istanbul Agop there, for me, like when I switched over to those, you know, the amount of symbol you get for your money with those, yeah. to me, is is the like the selling the drawing point of that really because they're just such you, you mean i think you mentioned those symbols to me years back and yeah you know they I, I never listened to them or tried them and then i was asked to try them and i was just like yeah. blown away by how amazing they were me too um i use um one of the ride symbols i particularly like is a mel lewis riveted ride and um, it's on every recording i've done for the last 20 years mm. I keep I've got loads of other rides you know what it's like and I put them up and think no I've got to go back I've got to go back to that one yeah and the, the stick just melts into it and it's got all the articulation you want but it feels nice to play as well mm. so yeah I'm a massive fan of those symbols now on to a question that some people have found really tough um, but I'm not here to make your life easy, James. So mm. if you had to pick just one, who would be your all time favorite drummer? Oh, God. Just one. Well, it depends on what week we're in, really, doesn't it? Or what year we're in, perhaps, as well, for me. Um, I'll tell you what, let me give you. I knew you'd ask this, so I just thought, oh, God, I'm going to go blank. I, I made a note. Right. I've got a very quick top 10. Right. Yeah. I'll start with Ringo. I really was drawn to put in Ringo at number one because of his creativity and how he invented perhaps the signature drum part for songs. You can hear, if you hear the, the groove of Tomorrow Never Knows or Come Together or Ticket to Ride, you know what the song is by what Ringo is playing. So, um, he's so creative. If you think back, I mean, even I'm being quite old, I don't remember the sixties, but historically, I know what everyone else was doing at that time. And who was doing anything that was so creative? You know, drummers were keeping time and they were really great drummers, but Ringo had something unique about his playing. And I always think of Ringo when I'm working with songwriters. What would Ringo do here? You know, I know his timing's a little bit wonky here and there, but I don't know. It just sounds, it feels good. Mm. And once you get past the technical thing, I know some drummers find that very difficult, um, but I think they should look again mm. and, and stop thinking perhaps about pure technique. You know, if Buddy Rich was in the Beatles, it would have been a disaster. So, um, okay. Secondly, John Bonham, power, groove, dynamics. But Bonham can't be the top for me because he only ever played with one band. Mm. That did happen to be a good band, but you know, I don't get the versatility of working with different people. 
but Bonham is someone else who I'll never tire of. Mm. Jim Keltner, his work with, with virtually everybody, but particularly Rai Kuda, his kind of unconventional feel and creativity, massive fan. Bill Bruford, intelligence, creativity, polyrhythmic, sharp. I'm a massive Bruford fan. Um, right, I've got more. Tony Williams, mm. that ride symbol. On the 60s, Nefertiti, Miles Smiles, the ride symbol. I still can't get over that. Perhaps I started with Neil Peart, his composition, the way that drum parts would be written and developed. And there was no improvisation really, but the way they were written, they was part of the song structure. So Neil Peart is always in my mind when I'm, when I'm trying to come up with anything. You know, I don't want to play like him, but the thought process. Stuart Copeland, hi-hat, polyrhythms. Stuart Copeland's hi-hat playing still makes my head spin. I just, touch is unbelievable. Of course, Steve Gadd, what can you say? You know? Yeah, you don't need to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, he was so untouchable and unknowable when I started out in the 80s and 90s. There was never, I'm dealing with Paul Simon at the arena, you know, and you couldn't dream of meeting him. And then in the last few years, Gad is over at Ronnie Scott's Peace for Express. I've met him quite a few times and he's such a sweet guy. He's so humble. Mm. I remember meeting him once where I said, um, I, I, I caught a gig earlier in the year and Steve, Steve had invited his manager over to shake my hand and say, this guy, he saw it. He's seen us twice this year. Oh, thanks, man. It's really, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> It was all my pleasure. Um, okay, um, but perhaps my number one, it has to be for me, Phil Collins. Mm. Now, much maligned because of his pop career, but if we go back to the 1970s, his work with Genesis particularly is awe-inspiring. The way he navigates odd time and complex structures, you never feel the bar line. You know, you don't always realise that the song is in seven until you try to play it and think, well, hang on, oh, we're in seven. Mm. And it just, he flows around it. So his creativity with Genesis and his touch is fantastic. But he also worked with Brian Eno, Peter Gabriel. He invented that drum sound on Gabriel 3 for Intruder, the gated thing. Then, of course, there's that drum fill. You know, I must admit, I've seen Phil Collins live a lot of times and it was always a special moment. You know, some drummers get a little bit, a bit snooty about it. Like, it's just when you go to an arena and you see thousands of people excited by a drum fill, mm. oh, it's just magical. Yeah. So I think Phil Collins is the one I kept thinking, you know, who, who could it be? But I listen to him more than anyone else. So I'll give you that one. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's a good rundown. But the, the drum we were talking about, I thought that that was played by a big hairy gorilla. Yeah. Um, well, that was Phil in a suit. Ah, right. He wasn't a real gorilla. Just because a lot of my students have been telling me when I tell them about, <laughs> you know, that Phil and, 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 that, and that Phil, um, they say, Oh no! Wasn't that wasn't that a gorilla in a cabinet? I did a, I did a school assembly last, well, just before the, the lockdown, um, and we had a, about four hundred kids, and I was showing them some drum things, and I have put the video of the gorilla playing. The excitement in the room, it was just fantastic. All those kids were just just overexcited, and yeah. the thought of that gorilla doing that, I just. <laughs> So Phil will just have to live with the gorilla taking the, uh, all the, uh, exactly. <laughs> now on to another one that, um, people have found difficult, but I, I personally think that I already know the answer to this question for you and, uh, that it'll be a really easy answer. Um, so 
what's been the highlight of your career so far? And I mean, I'm happy to answer it for you if you want. Surely, just like meeting and, and teaching me. Well, what did, how did you know? <laughs> well, I just, I just thought I'd just guess, I didn't, you, you know. I didn't want to embarrass you by saying it. You know, I've written it down here and crossed it out in yeah. crayon. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a life changing moment when you turned up at the college. And um, I had to reevaluate a few things about myself, you know, my instant dislike of, no, um, my instant fear of your amazing capabilities. No, it was great teaching you, Tom, actually. And I am very proud of what you've done. I, I wish I could take more credit. Anyway, I, I won't do that. Um, okay, career highlight. Um, couple of things then starting my own music school music station we probably taught about 150,000 lessons in the last seven years so I'm quite quite proud of that I'm writing I'm, I actually wrote um, the Trinity or the lead consultant for the Trinity rock and pop syllabus um, so I'm very proud of that that's gone worldwide so um, I sometimes get updates from Trinity and someone told me that loads of children in India are, are studying our syllabus and uh, oh. you know that's a big market in India yeah <laughs> <laughs> they, they really like it so that was 18 months of very very hard work to try to come up with a new ethos based on authenticity mm. and, and what, what it really is to be a player and not the other syllabus is more about, I don't know, it feels more classically orientated, you know, and that's great, you know, but in my career, that sort of playing hasn't really come up. So I just, I teach to my strengths. Mm. And um, so Trinity were very brave in going with it. Um, it made me very nervous because they spent a lot of money on the new syllabus. And I was thinking, oh, if I've got this wrong, and what if everyone's going to hate me? Uh, but um, it's gone really well. So I'm very, very chuffed with that. Um, and probably my favourite moment playing drums live was playing at the Albert Hall with Matt Berry when we supported Stephen Wilson. Um, that, that felt like a real kind of moment because I've been to the Albert Hall and seen many, many artists. And uh, to be getting on that stage, um, Stephen Wilson and the band were so nice. Craig Blundell was so sweet, and Gavin Harrison was guesting that night. So um, during the sound check, I must admit, I polished my drums while they were sound checking for about an hour. Um, <laughs> my drums were very clean, but <laughs> just to be on stage with a band of that caliber mm. and just watching them work. For me, it's just a massive lesson, you know, watching the highest possible level of musicianship. So that that was pretty cool. Um, doing the gig with Stephen Wilson and the band watching us from the wings was interesting. So this way we've got 5,000 people. This way we've got the world's greatest musicians. And I remember sitting down at the kit thinking, maybe I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I shouldn't be here. And then I started thinking, strangely, as I sat down, I thought, oh, I wonder if John Bonham sat his kit. Oh, I don't think that. I don't yeah. think that. <laughs> then, oh, yeah, Ringo played here in 62. Don't think that. Oh, remember Hendrix, that gig Hendrix did. Don't think about it. So I had to give myself a stern mm. talking to as I sat down. I remember Matt Berry said to me, actually, in the wings, he said he was pacing around. And he said, are you okay? Are you nervous? And I said, no, not at all. I'm really looking forward to this. I lied. And um, he said, oh, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you're not nervous because, you know, you'll keep everything together. I said, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. And, I, you know, my legs were just about giving way, you know. But <laughs> little tip there. So when you're working with, uh, with singers, always give them the confidence they need to be out the front. Mm. because. For us, it's terrifying, but I'm sitting at the back behind all these drums. So 
there's a kind of security here, but I wouldn't want to go out the front no. and, and face them. So, you know, never let the singer know that you're nervous. Yeah. Because they'll be more nervous. And then everything starts to unravel. So anyway, little tip there. Yeah. So that was probably my, my proudest moment live so far. Good stuff. Now, from career highlights to the other end of the scale, have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from? And by that, we're talking brain fails, gear fails, all of the above. Oh, I did have one particular night. On the Blues Brothers tour, um, we were playing at the Reading Hexagon. And um, we'd been on tour for about six months. And uh, my drum kit was on a very, very big riser. In fact, I had to climb up a ladder to get, it was about six feet up. So I always thought in the beginning of the tour, I'm just going to sit here during this monologue bit where, you know, it's a West End show. So there's a lot of chat and the rest of the band would all disappear. And I would just sit there quietly in the shadows. And it was a hot night in July. I thought, I'm going to get off tonight. I can't sit here and listen to seven minutes of this again. So I got off and everyone was backstage in the green room drinking coffee and I thought, oh, what have I been doing? This is great. So I, I you know, I had a drink, then went to the loo, came back and everyone had gone. Um, and I thought, oh, I better go, better go. And backstage at the theatre, if you haven't done a gig in the theatre, you've got speakers that you can hear what's going on on stage. And I could hear my cue coming up and um, I thought, I better get on, I better get on. I got lost and I could not find the stage and big, heavy sta big stage curtains. I, di I didn't realize they have lead at the bottom of these curtains. You can't pick them up. I was trying to crawl under in panic and I could hear my cue coming up. And it was um, one of the singers would go, you want to dance? Well, get off your butts and dance. And then I would count in Soul Man. And I could hear it coming up and I was just running like a rat in a trap and I could hear it coming. And just as he said it, I got to the side of the stage, the wrong side of the stage by the keyboard player as the spotlight went onto my empty drum stall. <laughs> I didn't know I had a spotlight. I hadn't, hadn't noticed and that everyone was frozen on stage waiting for the moment. And it was complete silence. And I just thought, well, I ran across the stage. You could hear my footsteps. And then I climbed up the ladder, sat down, picked up the sticks. By now my hands are like, and I counted the song off and the band are laughing so hard. The whole song was a disaster. And um, the stage manager, I saw her in the wings with the notebook. He was looking at me again. So I never got off stage again. Um, <laughs> I stayed very safely next to the kit with the sticks in hand so I could count the song in. So that was my, I still wake up in a cold sweat sometimes thinking about that moment. So thanks for um, letting me relive that with you. Tom. You know what? I, I've done a lot of these interviews now and that is actually one of the best <laughs> that anyone has said. That is that is brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very and, much. And you know what? I've actually had a very similar thing happen to me. Oh, no. Um, and I may as well share it. So with, Come on, then. with the current band Purple Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven, anyone that knows oh. that song, of course, the first, what, four minutes or so? No drums. So I do exactly what you do. I, I go backstage, I fill up my water bottle, go to the loo quickly. And then generally I stand in the side like side stage waiting for my vocal cue when I know and the forests will echo with laughter right now I walk back on and I was off and I'm not gonna point any fingers here but the singer sang it wrong um, and he missed a verse um, and I was in the loo and over as you say over the, the like the uh, speakers backstage um, I heard and the forests echo with laughter and I'm like I'm not gonna have a chance to wash my hands here and I legged it back onto the stage 
I legged it back to the stage, but it was a really long way. Uh, and I missed my cue and they all just carried on playing the song with no drums because of course it, there was, should have been a whole other verse and uh, and then I managed to just like get back on and like start it in an appropriate place yeah <laughs> anyone that was there you know that knew that song really well which was would have been pretty much every single person would have been like what is going on this is a unusual did you sign it out as though that was always meant to happen i did but then afterwards everyone was like what was what, were you, what was that all about <laughs> and you can't blame the singer no i did politely say i'm yeah. afraid you know i mean i'm not scared to say this anymore because we don't have the same singer anymore so it's fine but oh that's good that's good <laughs> but you know but then that's the thing isn't it sometimes there's a lesson there don't rely on anybody else you know yeah. Yeah, I I should, one, one of my big lessons actually is the singer is always right. Mm. So in any circumstance on stage, the singer is always right. And if you always keep that in your head, no matter if they're wrong or not, because if you go with what they do, mm -hmm. you'll be right. And if yeah. you, if they make a mistake and you decide to do the right thing, then you make them look bad. You make you look bad. Everybody looks bad. So, you know, I've been in a number of situations where, you know, I look over at the bass player and it's like, yep, let's just come in now. And yeah, yeah. the singer has missed a verse out. And, you know, mistakes happen. So you've got you to look out for each other, haven't you? Exactly. And I, I totally uh, agree with you, you know, going with the singer. However, in that instance, it was very hard to, to go with the singer when I was in the middle of doing another one. <laughs> um, so, you know. I wish I'd seen that. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, now on to uh, a question about how you learn material. Um, when you first get a gig with a new artist, or if you're doing a recording, or you're just learning new material, how do you learn the stuff? Do you just listen and just take it in and, oh, I've got it, great, boom. Um, do you listen and transcribe? Uh, or does anyone say, oh, James, here is the entire folder of the whole set in, written out in drum music. Just go away and learn that. That has only ever happened to me once with the Blues Brothers tour. Um, and I had a month. So that was fine. Um, since then, um, that's never happened. Um, so I do actually, depends on the material, you know, and and the, maybe the profile of the gig, because if it's a big gig, there is more pressure. And if people know the material perhaps as well, then you have to be a little bit more, um, you know, on your game. So I do tend to transcribe note for note. And um, the strange thing is, I do it all in Sibelius. And um, I've never ever used it after I transcribed it. So the very act of sitting there transcribing means that I've memorized it. I have all this stuff with me in the rehearsal, not on the stage. Um, and find that, I'll tell you what, actually, the, the big mistake I made a couple of years back is I did that. I transcribed the whole set and I started the rehearsal playing along with my own transcription. And it was very hard to then shut the book. Yeah. I really shouldn't have done that. You know, I just didn't want to screw up, mm. but I find get off the chart as soon as possible. Um, I say it to all my students okay. for um, their grade exams. The amount of kids that will play miss all the drums because they're looking at, <laughs> and I, I actually say to them, you're looking at it, but you're not seeing it. Mm. I know you're looking at it are you really reading it we can all do that you know you can just stare at a page of music so i what i try to do for everybody whether they do an exam or not is you know the book is there to help you learn then shut the book and there will be the odd song where you think you know that arrangement that's doing my head in okay keep the book open for that one song but just glance at it you mustn't stare at it. So then I always try to get them to play to the audience, even if there is no audience. And not this, or not that. Um, we, all, we all can do it. 
and I recognize that in myself sometimes. Um, but of course, as soon as you come off the page, shoulders go back, you hit everything cleaner, it sounds sharper. And I say, imagine you've got a load of people there, look over their heads, play out, play out towards the audience. And um, I don't think a lot of younger people realize the capacity we have for learning. I mean, you're set with Purple Zeppelin. I mean, how many songs have you memorized? The show is, without the interval, it's over two hours long, even without the interval. So that's a lot of material. Yeah, and obviously there's segues. So yeah, there's like there's, there's a lot of songs. Yeah, but um, in in fairness, I do still have my notes. You know, I still have this iPad with my my notes, but I don't read them. It's just a, a yeah. comfort blanket next to me, just right. in case. But yeah, I totally agree with what you say about not like needing it, not relying on it. I had a big lesson on the first night of that Blues Brothers West End tour thing. And we were playing at the Brighton um, Theatre Royal. And we'd done a month of rehearsals. It was a big show, you know, it was really good fun to do. And um, the MD went around in the sound shop and just grabbed everyone's music and said, you're not having that tonight. And I hadn't even contemplated the fact that the music wouldn't be there. Mm. And um, that show was very, very terrifying. But then, of course, I never needed to, you can't, it's not classical music. We're not playing with an orchestra, you know, memorize the tunes. So that's how I, I mainly learn. Mm. And if I'm doing a session now, everything's on my own now because of the lockdown. I tend to just do bar numbers now. It's strange. I've got a whole new method. So I'll just have um, intro and then it will say, um, you know, um, chorus starts bar 24. And I have the big count off thing on my screen in front of me. And as I, uh, 19, 20, oh yeah, that's where I'm feeling the chorus. Yeah, okay. So I'm using a, a mixture of memory, mainly memory, but with the odd thing. So there's a songwriter I'm working with who does some weird, odd stuff, you know, two, four bars. So, you know, I'll have, a note that will say bar 78 two four two four you know and it's great bar 70 i'm not counting bars the machine is counting the bars i hate counting bars hmm. so that's the new method that's working really well for me at the moment what are your hobbies away from drums um more drums reading about drums writing about drums um, recording drums, polishing drums, um, watching YouTube videos of drums, and photography. Um, <laughs> of drums. <laughs> mainly of drums. It's been a strange life I've led, um, and uh, I've enjoyed most of it. So yeah, it's mainly, the thing is, if you really want to do something, I don't think there's a lot of time. Some people can do lots of things, you know, and I'm very envious of them that they can be of a, a good standard on all sorts of issues. But I just do the one thing a lot and it's got me to a level where I can play and teach where I'm not embarrassing myself you know, and I get some nice gigs here and there. Um, and now I do all my own photography and shoot my own videos. And I'm writing a drum book at the moment. Um, and this drum book is, oh, it's about 10 years in the making. So I've just been going through my Sibelius files this week and there are so many hundreds of them. Um, so now the hard work really begins. Mm. You know, you've written a book recently. It's really challenging, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it took up a lot of time, but... Uh... <laughs> I was determined to get it done before my little girl was born, just because I knew that when she was here, two yeah. children, no time at all. <laughs> no, no, no chance. <laughs> and that, you know, I like your answer there because that's exactly the reason I wrote that question. Because just because drums become our livelihood, you know, for me, I uh, obviously went to college where I met you as my drum tutor, 
and I did that because, okay, maybe I wanted to make drums my living or whatever, but right then, in the moment, I just wanted to do drums. It was my hobby and I loved it. And um, so it doesn't mean that drums can't still be our hobby, does it? So, you know, that's a great yeah. answer. Yeah, so, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> And now for the most anticipated question of the entire interview series. This is the this is the question. So, what's your favourite biscuit? It's not a proper biscuit. Sorry, it has to be a Kit Kat. It has biscuit in it, but it's covered in chocolate. I know you wouldn't dunk it necessarily. You could, um, but the Kit Kat, yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm and sorry. then, well, the next part of that question is, yeah, normally would you dunk it, but you've obviously said that you wouldn't. But one of these interviews I did recently with Ben Thompson from Two Door Cinema Club, he, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but he um, mentioned the Kit Kat straw, and uh, he, he challenged Ooh. me to try the Kit Kat straw. And so you get a Kit Kat, you have your cup of tea, you break one of the fingers off and you use the Kit Kat. At, no, you bite the ends off, the chocolate ends off the Kit Kat, and then you suck the tea through the Kit Kat <laughs> like a straw. Um, and you know what? Initially, it was quite nice, but then I think possibly my tea was too hot. So, of course, the entire thing started to fall to bits. So, I think the trick with it is make sure your tea is lukewarm. Um, <laughs> and then it basically oh, melts the inside wafer biscuit bit, and you're left with this Kit Kat straw not to be done while you're teaching See, no definitely not no absolutely not conventional kit kat eating it can happen while i'm teaching i can turn my mic off here and notice can't hear me <laughs> i can eat my kit kat um the trouble with these mics is if you try eating anything secretly mm -hmm. It doesn't work. <laughs> so um, we're kind of trapped in the online lesson thing. It, it's weird. I do miss walking around mm. and picking my nose and things. And <laughs> all the stuff that you'd normally do in a lesson, mm. you're here. All the things I'm, All the things I remember you doing at college, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yawning behind your back. Like, <laughs> oh, well, you're struggling on something. Oh, <laughs> exactly. I watch, you know, thinking, oh, when's this over? Um, no, it's very intense now, but in fact, many of the students have benefited from that intensity. Um, it's tiring for us teachers because you really are on the whole time, but I've noted uh, some of the marks for the online exams are, you know, it's just incredible. We, we have, we've had lots of in the nineties. Um, I had a grade eight student just before lockdown though, he got 98%. Um, I remember the examiner came out and said, I've knocked two marks off. I don't know why, but I didn't <laughs> want to give him a hundred. So, uh, but yeah, loads of kids are doing very well with the online thing. It's just us teachers that are uh, exhausted. And yeah, out. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and my final question for you today, James, if you could give one piece of advice to your younger self. So when you first started learning the drums, what would that advice be? Um, I think it would have to be the groove thing. Um, learn to love the click, make friends with the click. Too many people fight the click or don't want to use it. Um, it's not going away now because everything's computerized. And um, I don't tend to like, I don't like quantize on musical instruments i don't like it one bit i find it sucks the life out and the the individuality of the player you know and of course once you quantize one bit then the next bit has to be quantized and i remember doing a song a while back where i think it just had a kind of and the engineer said, oh, I might just quantize that, you know, pull it in a bit more. And he, you know, quantized it all. And it just sounded so terrible. And we just laughed and said, Control Z. Yeah. Let's go back. And if the odd snare is late or early, that's called feel. Mm. Um, if you're good enough, hopefully, you know, where it's, it doesn't sound bad. So I would say um, 
learn to groove don't look at instagram chops too much the gospel chops um please don't because if you played like that on virtually any gig in the world you will be fired um i don't know why drums are an athletic pursuit an olympic sport um and i you know stop working on polyrhythms and all sorts of stuff until you can play a straight groove i remember i had a session with max roach once it was a real privilege i was you know there's a, there a few of us there and someone said what do you practice and he said well for the first few years he just practiced quarter notes on the ride I'm thinking, what quarter notes? You know, Max Roach. And he played. This was in the festival hall in the daytime, so there was no one else there. And it was unamplified. And his ride cymbal filled the whole room. And the elasticity between every note, it just sounded the, the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. So I would say, work on that. Work on the groove, play to click. Don't use quantizers unless you really have to. Learn to play it well within the click, and then you can move around with the click track. Mm. Um, and um, you know, if you want to get into the chopsy stuff, fine afterwards. And there's always these um, outlier drummers, the Dennis Chambers, the Thomas Langs. But a uh, very quick story, Thomas Lang. I did a gig once where the singer said to me. Um, I just uh, joined the group and she said, oh, I much prefer you to our last drummer. And I'm like, oh, that's nice of you to say. And uh, I said, who was he? He said, oh, this guy called Tommy. I said, oh, yeah. Tommy who? I might know him. She said, uh, Tommy Lang. This was back in the 90s. And I said, what, Thomas Lang? Yeah, he, said, he kept playing drum solos every five seconds and uh, I couldn't hear myself sing. I really didn't like playing with him. I much prefer you. So I can always say to people that I'm better than Thomas Lang um, because I was just, <laughs> I was just playing, um, you know, at that level. And she said, Thomas would be playing, you know, much heavier. I mean, the guy's a genius, obviously, you know, I, I love watching him, but, um, that was a lesson to me back in the 1990s mm. about stop worrying about what he's doing because he's got a career that is unique to him and the guy is a genius mm. but i'm not that person so if singer songwriters are telling me to play less and play quieter instead of arguing with them you know i mean younger drummers might say well i can't play quieter it's a drum kit you know learn to play quiet learn to play in time you will have singers smiling at you all of the time it's easier to play loud mm. i don't have to practice to play loud i have to practice to play quietly mm. so that's my uh, tuppence worth so james thank you so much for spending your time with us here at drumwise today and also thank you for the knowledge that you have passed on to me over the years as my drum tutor it's been oh, an right. absolute pleasure Thank you very much, Tom. It's been a pleasure.